Hi guys, I'm Andy Smith. This is Dr. Will Houston, uh, and welcome along to this week's Alakazam Book Corner. So guys, this week I'm joined by Dr. Will Houston. Hello. Nice to see you again, Will. Uh, Will is currently here with us uh, doing his Alakazam Live, his academy. Um, things are going great. Uh, we are learning lots of great coin magic. Um, we've had um, some great chats, some great feedback. Um, so um, despite the hot weather, uh, we're, main, uh, try, we're actually maintaining it with a, with a, a cool sense of calmness, I think, um, considering it's hot. Um, and uh, yeah, things are, are really g going very well. So, uh, Will, one of the things I didn't ask you in the academy, uh, and this might actually come up again tonight anyway, um, is how did you first get into, into magic? What first inspired you in magic? What were your first exposures to it? Uh, so I first became interested in magic because a friend of my grandfather's was a very fine magician, a man called Claude Perry uh, from Cambridge, and he heard from my grandmother that I'd been given a few magic ki uh, magic sets, as a child often is, uh, and then he wrote me a letter saying that he was a magician and he hoped I wouldn't mind too much uh, if he sent me a few little bits and pieces uh, that I might enjoy playing with. Uh, and in that package, he sent me a few tricks, but also a couple of books. Okay. Uh, the Pat Page Big Book of Magic, the Walter B. Gibson Big Book of Magic, uh, and the Kingfisher Book of Magic. Right. Uh, so I read those, enjoyed them very much, and it sort of started a seven or so year correspondence with Claude. Um, and then eventually I met him, we spent time together in person okay. uh, as well. Excellent. Okay. Uh, and for the, I mean, it, for us that got into into magic um, when we did, it was very much about the uh, books that you were introduced to. Um, myself, I, my first magic book was the Mark Wilson course, uh, mm -hmm. or one of the first magic books was the Mark Wilson course. Um, some stuff by uh, Edwin Dawes um, in, a, in a book that he'd released um, for, the, for the general public. Um, and then it kind of went from there. But n nowadays, the, the the first exposure isn't necessarily for a book. I mean, it might be for a trick, or it might be for a DVD, or certainly YouTube, um, and that sort of exposure, or seeing a magician. But if you were, uh, say, receiving a present from someone, it's not. It's less likely to be a book. I feel now than it would be some other form of of introduction, like a trick that someone's bought, or or gift vouchers, or, or, or things like that. Um, where did you kind of go from there? I mean, I know that you, you're, you're extremely well read. Um, you've also authored um, some books as well um, on, on magic. So what, what sort of magic books inspire you? What are the ones that you would constantly go back to and, and have a look at if you're looking for inspiration or, or to research? So I suppose two parts to that question. One is which of the books which I sort of found useful as I yeah. developed and one is which are the ones I look at most now. Uh, one of the first books, which is a little bit of a revelation, I suppose, uh, was the first sort of proper magic book uh, that I bought, or my parents in truth bought for me, uh, from a magic shop, which I had heard was very good at a young magician's club workshop right. at the Magic Circle. Uh, and it was Guy Hollingworth's Drawing Room Deceptions. Right, okay. So I sort of made a little bit of a jump, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, starting with the Kingfisher Book of Magic and then moving up to Guy's stuff. And thought it seemed rather difficult. Yeah. Uh, but presumably that's just what proper magic was mm -hmm. and learned a number of tricks from it and then after a little while got a copy of the Royal Road to Card Magic right. and found out that maybe it wasn't quite so difficult after all um, and there were other things that I could do a little bit more easily. Right. So that was I think important uh, mainly because Guy's work is occasionally challenging mm -hmm. uh, from a technical standpoint and it sort of introduced me to the idea that magic was stuff that you did have to work at, you did have to practice, you did have to spend time with. Right rather than, oh yeah, there's easy tricks if you want to do easy tricks, mm -hmm. and then you can do more difficult things later. Yeah, it is, um, it's interesting that you said about um, about the, the, the difficulty levels, because sometimes, um, certainly, you know, when I got into magic, the, the Mark Wilson course, I think, is one of those books where there is some easy stuff in there, there's, sli there's some slightly more challenging stuff. Um, it, it has such a broad range of different material, um, that you're you're kind of getting the best of everything. Um, you're not put off if it's too difficult because there's some easy work that you can work on. Um, but if you like the challenge, then that work is there. Should you wish to wish to try it out, um, 
Do you, do you think that, uh, because uh, we were conversing yesterday before your academy and it, it did get raised last night in the academy as well, do you think that, um, I mean, we were talking about, uh, you know, achieving uh, different things so that you produce certain effects. In other words, if you want, uh, to, want to achieve a certain effect, then sometimes difficult ways to do that are the ways that produce the best effect. Not always the case, but sometimes that that is, that is true. So you have to work at it. Um, do you think that possibly with with some magic books, uh, as good as they might be, it, it kind of the the stuff in there may not be as challenging because in a lot of magic books, especially ones that are released to the public, let's say, uh, they kind of contain things that are almost self working um, or are self working. Some that aren't necessarily that good a, a trick. Uh, I'm of the opinion that there's nothing that, that there isn't really. Oh, well, there are bad tricks, but you know, it, it's so kind of few stinkers. Yeah, there. well, there, there there are, but also, you know, <coughs> I've seen I've seen people present stuff that I I might have considered first of all to not be a very good trick, beautifully, and, and think, wow, do you know that that is really very good? Absolutely, but I suppose this is a question that your presentation will give you a certain amount of benefit. Mm-hmm. The quality of the material you select will give you a certain amount of benefit. The setting will give you a certain amount of benefit. Yeah, and you can take a trick which is perhaps not very good and use those other things to lift it up to a higher level than it might otherwise be at. Right. But if you started with a great trick, then you perhaps could elevate it to an even higher level because yeah. the material was better to start with. Right, okay. Perhaps. Right, okay. Well, no, I, I think that's valid. And uh, as I've maintained on the other uh, book reviews or talks that I've ever done on books, you know, that the, the, you interpret things as, as you see fit. What works for one person may not work for the other, but that's... That's part of, the, part of the journey. It's it's that experience and that looking at what is written uh, on the page or indeed between the lines as well, and just trying to dissect it and, and go for, go for um, go for the interpretation that is is true to you um, rather than possibly what you think it should it should be. Um, so uh, the raw road to card magic, and uh, we had uh, the uh, Pat Page Big Book of Magic. We did. Um, so, uh, moving on from the raw road to card magic, um, obviously over the years, um, your interest in sleight of hand has peaked more and more. Um, what other books would you say that you went on for, from there? Um, did you did you look at classic texts? Did you look at things like Erdnays? Uh, because Erdnays, over the last couple of years, certainly has become more and more popular. Would you say it was a book that when you were still um, relatively new to magic you, you would be looking at or was it not really referenced? Yeah, it was certainly a book which I picked up at some point in my late teens and enjoyed reading. Um, I suppose the thing about Erdnays now is Erdnays is sort of a, a brand that you can use to sell stuff. Right. You know, if you make your playing cards and you say they're Erdnays green rather than normal green, yeah. you can sell an extra thousand decks yeah. uh, versus what you might otherwise. And so the name is probably more recognised. I wonder whether more people have actually read it or thought about any of the stuff in it right? Um, okay. because of that. Um, but yeah, Erdnays was certainly around. Expert card technique was around. Marlowe's revolutionary card technique, mm-hmm. that Magic Inc. Yeah. The compiled version came out, which was very good. Uh, I remember reading Ernest Eric's book by Forces Unseen for the first time. Which is an um, amazing book, <laughs> which is uh, truly a very, very good book if you, uh, for, I think, uh, for plot construction and uh, some some uh, approaches to, to sleight of hands. Uh, it's a yeah, it's a rather book. entertaining book. When it first came out, people decided that perhaps Stephen Minch was just playing a little bit of a joke on them mm-hmm. and had published a book of undoable material because no one had really come across this guy, Ernie, yeah. uh, and everyone suspected that maybe you just couldn't do these tricks mm-hmm. uh, as they were described. And then a little bit later on, I suppose, Ernie sort of started hanging out with a few more people few more people saw it and realised, oh no, actually, you can do this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and certainly I had that experience. There's a move in there called the Lazy Susan Steel. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very good steel, very interesting construction of a move. Could not for the life of me see how this could possibly be done deceptive. It just doesn't make any sense as mm-hmm. far as I was concerned. Um, I had a chance, thanks to Ray Cosby and Bill Goodwin, to spend a little time with Ernie and Albuquerque in New Mexico. And over dinner, I showed him a few variations on this move that I'd come up with because I couldn't do the, the one he'd described and said, I don't really understand it. And he very softly and very gently sort of went, oh, well, 
you know, I just enjoyed playing with these things, so maybe it didn't really work. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that look, by the way? And I'm going, well, I mean, if you did it, it looked good, but clearly you didn't do it because I would have seen that. It's like, oh, no, no, this, this was it. And you go, great. I now know that you can do this thing <laughs> perfectly acceptably. Uh, I still have absolutely no idea quite how because it still doesn't physically seem like it should work. Yeah. But Ernie certainly could do it. Right, um, right. I okay. suspect that was the case with everything in that book. The, uh, uh, yeah, and that must have been an amazing experience. And uh, I, I've referred back to the book on many occasions and, and, uh, and thought, uh, you know, this, this sounds amazing. Um, it wasn't until recently I managed to see uh, Dennis Bear um, perform a routine from there called Claptrap. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, trust me, um, if you get a chance, Jump on YouTube, watch Dennis Baird perform Claptrap because it is a it's a great routine, um, and watching it and knowing methods that are kind of going on in there, you could consider it to be quite a difficult routine from a sleight of hand point of view. But you know it's performed beautifully and effortlessly as well. So um, yeah, uh, really quite amazing stuff. Um, so how? Over the years, do you think your your taste have changed maybe with, with uh, books that you, you read? Because I know um, that you are a keen magic historian. Um, it is uh, probably not news to people out there that you, you know, you've um, looked through the Magic Circles uh, library, uh, uh, older texts. Um, so uh, how do you think your taste towards ma approaching magic books and the things you're looking for have changed uh, with that sort of influence in mind as well? Yeah, I think I've got less interested in books of tricks. Right. Um, certainly, I remember, with a little bit of sort of sadness almost, um, getting Alex Elmsey the collected works mm -hmm. that LML published, Stephen Minch edited, in both volumes of it, and sitting upstairs in my room with them, and doing every trick. And not just kind of reading the effect for every trick, but reading the effect and the method, then making sure I got everything that I needed to have a go at it, mm -hmm. then having a go at it, doing it enough times that I could remember it without needing to check back at the instructions, mm -hmm. trying showing the trick to somebody, and then moving on to the next trick, mm -hmm. and doing that with all 600 whatever it is tricks in the, the book. Yeah. And I don't think I have the capacity to read a magic book in that way <laughs> uh, now, frankly. So I find myself... Um, more of a sort of skim reader probably than right. I used to be. Right. Um, but I also find myself more and more interested in the books which aren't just a collection of tricks right. as opposed to the ones that are. Right, um, okay. Certainly when I was younger, I just wanted more tricks. Right. So that was the answer. Okay. Um, uh, so so in uh, the way that your approach to reading the magic book has changed, that, that is, I think, um, something that... Uh, Certainly, I mean, you, you saying about the Alex Elmsley books there, uh, I remember getting them and I, I haven't been through half the content in, in them. And the same is true for um, Mint, uh, the Mint mm -hmm. books. I, I remember getting those and not going through half the content. But I think that you, you, start to, you, you start to look a little bit deeper than just what's on the written page. And you're probably finding um, that because your interest has changed and you, you look at uh, older books that... You, you are looking for uh, things that aren't just, like you said, about the tricks. Um, so maybe the little piece of information, the, the author's thinking behind, behind his approach to what he's describing. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that, I, I mean, books, uh, and I've said this before as well, books aren't nearly as popular as they were when I started out in magic many years ago. Uh, to learn some good magic, you bought the la the latest books that were there. Things like uh, Jennings sixty seven and mm -hmm. um, the classic magic of Harry Jennings, those sort of books. And do you think that um, wh why do you think that the approach to books has has diminished so greatly? I mean, there are obvious answers, but do you think that that there is any anything else that you can think of that has stopped the the publication of books as much as what they were? Um, I think it's a smaller audience. If there's a smaller audience, you can't do such a big run. If you can't do such a big run, you can't save as much money in the printing costs. Your yeah. set-up costs are a higher percentage. Yeah. And if you don't know you can sell 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 copies, it's harder to make something nice and mm -hmm. spend time doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so I certainly think that's a problem. I think there have been more bad quality books um, because the world of desktop publishing makes it much easier to make a book. Yeah. Um, 
There's certainly a point where you go, if you want to make a really good book, then you need LML to think that your book will be great, or you need Minch to think your book will be great, or you need Kaufman to think that your book will be great. Yeah. And so you have those guys almost acting as kind of a gateway, yeah. where they're saying, look, we've seen quite a lot of stuff, we have some idea of what makes a good book, and this does fit it, this doesn't fit it, or this can fit it, but we need to shape it yeah. in order to make it fit into something that will work really well. Right. Uh, now, you can very easily do a book by yourself with your MacBook. Yeah. Um, publish it in very small numbers thanks to the print-on-demand stuff and you get some things which perhaps don't have the benefit that you would have got from a good editor and a good publisher right uh, historically right. so I think there are more bad books because of this perhaps yeah uh, then the last thing is that the good books because the market they're selling to has got smaller and smaller have become more and more premium sort of products mm. um, so you look at Kaufman's tenuism books for example uh, or Magic Christian's books on Hofzinser, or Mike Caveney's book on the Conference Wonders and his material, and they're being produced as these big coffee table books, beautifully mm -hmm. bound, a really lovely slip cover, yeah. lots of uh, debossing on the cover and so on, and they're being made as pretty expensive collector's things, yeah. which are going to cost several hundreds of pounds, probably, yeah. rather than 30, 40, 50 pounds, yeah. um, so, as sort of more mass-produced books did. Yeah, and that's going to be off-putting, I would think. So yeah, I, and uh, I mean, one of the um, <coughs> one type of uh, set that's been produced, uh, been produced like that recently is um, the Johnny Thompson books, um, mm. which, like you said, you know, they're they're a couple of hundred pounds to to purchase. Um, they are in, in limited numbers. Um, there is wait, uh, you know, waiting times for them. Um, but you are appealing to a, a you know a smaller audience because people. Um, they're not necessarily going to have the money that they're going to want to want to invest in in buying uh, a slip bound um, set of books. Yep. Um, are there? Um, so I, I guess the million dollar question is: Do you have uh, one or maybe several favourite magic books? Um, so one book I like very much is Modern Magic by Professor Hoffman, mm -hmm. um, mainly because Hoffman was the person I spent most of my time at university doing my PhD looking into, yeah. and Modern Magic is perhaps the book I would argue that's changed magic more than any other in the last 150 or so years. Right. Um, rather pleasingly as well, it was first published in 1876, uh, which means it's comfortably outside any sort of copyright legislation right. in any jurisdiction. Uh, so if you are interested in having a look for it, if you type modern magic into Google, you'll be able to find a PDF that you can read for free right. uh, rather than having to pick up a copy, which gets around that slipcase hardbound edition problem yeah, yeah, that quite. we were talking about a moment ago. So that's a very good book because of the changes that happened in magic based on it and around it, I think. Um, and certainly a book that my mentor Claude had. Uh, he used to have an afternoon snooze when I went to visit him after lunch, right. and I would read something from his bookshelves, and I certainly remember reading a copy of Modern Magic uh, whilst eating my leftover crisps from lunch, right. uh, noticing that perhaps I'd spilt a little bit of crisp on the book and feeling a little bit guilty <laughs> about it, but not feeling nearly as guilty as I did when he woke up and told me I'd made an excellent choice um, because that was a first edition Modern Magic from 1876 right. uh, that was one of the finest things in his collection. Um, I sort of discreetly trying to brush the crumbs out from the cracks yeah. inside it, uh, as he told me. Um, but yeah, so that's a magic book which I remember reading as a sort of early mid teenager okay and then i've still spent quite a lot of time reading more recently as well excellent excellent uh you um have also published books uh, as well can you tell us I a little heard. bit about yes. those uh so i've published two books uh the first one is called the notebook i wish i'd googled the title before i chose it because it turns out there's a relatively popular film of the same name uh, confusing people when they try and search for it no doubt uh, but nevertheless it's called the notebook and it's, uh, anonymous, it's an anonymously written, hand-dated, uh, handwritten, undated notebook. It's the least clear description of this book you've ever heard in your life. Uh, it's anonymously written, it's undated, and it's entirely handwritten. Uh, and it describes 81 and a half different card tricks. Right. Uh, it's in the Magic Circles collection. And after a year or so's research... Uh, I figured out that it was finished between 1792 and 1806, or thereabouts, um, based on the books that are referenced, the people he talks about seeing, and when I think the guy who wrote it may have died. Um, it describes all these old card tricks, and they become particularly interesting when you know when the book was written, because they're remarkably advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, you think of magic from the turn of the 18th century, 
perhaps as being quite primitive, double lifts and stuff not really being around and it all being quite clunky. Uh, this guy's talking about quite advanced double lift stuff. He's talking about false steals. He's talking about palms, palm switches, uh, stacked deck tricks, memorized deck tricks, think of a card tricks where you have someone think of one rather than choose one. Uh, using a memorized deck as a two-person coding system to right. secretly convey stuff to somebody else. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things which are really, really good. And I think all of that boils down to the fact that this was a notebook written by a magician for his own use or for the use of his colleagues. Right. Whereas most of the books that you can access from the time are books that were written by magicians or just by general book publishers to be sold at the end of magic shows right. or to cash in on the fact there was a famous magician in town at the time. Yeah. Uh, so those books tell you really what people were willing to talk about with the general public. Mm -hmm. uh, this book gives you an insight into what magicians were actually doing and were actually talking about amongst themselves. Yeah. Um, and I think is rather interesting on that basis. Yeah. Uh, the second book, which sort of followed on from this, was based on a manuscript in Peter Lane's collection. Peter's the executive librarian at the Magic Circle, a wonderful guy, a very knowledgeable historian, an amazing collection. Uh, and he had a manuscript by a guy called Professor Robert Hellis, uh, not particularly widely known, apart from perhaps the two versions of the Hellis Change, uh, which are published without attribution in Erdenay's, the expert at the card table, uh, with attribution in some of Hoffman's books and appear here and there elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, he was actually a pretty good magician. Uh, he owned a chain of photographic studios when photography was the latest high-tech invention. Everyone wanted to have their photo taken. Uh, but he also gave magic lessons and ran a dealer's merchants uh, where you could buy magic stuff right. uh, if you wanted to. And as part of that, he gave courses of lessons to people. He taught Hoffman before Hoffman wrote his books. Uh, he taught um, oh, John Holden, who wrote A Wizard's Wanderings from China to Peru. Uh, he gave a number of people magic lessons. Uh, Devant said that he was one of the finest drawing room performers that he ever saw, so very good pedigree. Yeah. And Peter had a manuscript, which was every trick Hellas had taught someone who was having lessons with him. Afterwards, he would write down a little notebook what the effect was, what the method was. Right. And then at the end of the course of lessons, he gave this notebook to his student. Uh, his student carried on having lessons from Hellas, also started to see other stuff, started to see some other dealers, see some of the things they were selling, carried on making notes in this book. Uh, and again, I've published a facsimile transcription of it right. and annotations. So you get a very good picture, I think, A, of what this guy, Professor Hellas, was teaching his students, uh, but also of what kinds of things were around in the London magic scene uh, in the 1860s, 1870s or thereabouts. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, so it just goes to show you that actually, when you when you delve into the rich history of magic, the, the you know the, the sort of things that you can discover, and uh, like I said earlier on, the kind of thinking behind uh, what the the author is trying trying to achieve with the, with their works. Um, so, just lastly, just to finish up, um, I, you may or may not have an answer to this. Um, how? How do you approach actually reading a magic book? You know, when you sit down to, to read um, a magic book, depending on what that is, um, how, how do you approach reading it? Um, you know, is there a particular... Um, I mean, you'd already mentioned that you skim, you, you tend to skim read now, but are, are there... Do you, do you annotate... Do you write in, in the books? Do you annotate in the books or do you make notes? I get a little bit precious about them, so I tend not to do the writing in the more the folding corners of the pages or I, that sort of thing. I am with you on that. Um, <laughs> I'm, particularly I'm not if that. there are $200 set of books which yeah. have got a nice slipcase and all this sort of thing. Uh -huh. uh, but I do sort of see the value in it right. uh, as well. I suppose I read quite a lot of material now as an editor mm -hmm. um, because it's going into one of the magazines that I do some work for or on. Uh, so in that case, you're trying to make sure that everything is as clear as possible, firstly, to you, so you feel you understand it, and then secondly, to somebody reading it, so mm -hmm. you're trying to make sure everything's being clearly written. Um, other than that, I just sort of collect ideas that I find interesting or that I like. Um, you can certainly read a book, I think, and not necessarily know what's going to be particularly useful or particularly interesting yeah. in the future. Um, but if you have an awareness of it, then you know that it's there, and you, if you know it's there, then you can find it later on. Yeah. And in terms of more focused, more targeted sort of reading where you're trying to find out about a thing, uh, I would very much recommend Ask Alexander. Um, it's an, an online database of magic books run by Conjuring Arts Research Centre in New York, mm -hmm. and they have scanned and made fully searchable 
thousands upon thousands, if not millions of pages uh, of magic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's a subscription thing, so you pay an amount per month or per year to be able to access and search through this database of material. Yeah. But there's so much there. Yeah. You can find almost anything. So yeah. if I want to find out about a person, I'm probably going there. No. Uh, when I wanted to do Hoffman stuff, I typed in Hoffman with a few variant spellings because people weren't always great at spelling his name right. And then I went through a few hundred thousand hits that came up in it to try and check everything okay. as much as possible. And that's a very good tool for that. Uh, the other tool there is, which is also very good uh, and you don't have to pay for, uh, is the Conjuring Archive, which Dennis Burr runs. Um, he sort of makes a, a digital contents almost of books, yeah. uh, but also puts little tags in. So if there's a trick and it's to do with riffle shuffling technique stuff, for example, yeah. he'll put a little hyperlink saying that it's to do with that. And if you click on this, then it'll bring up all of the other entries in the database which have that kind of thing in it. Yeah. Uh, as an added bonus, if you ever do manage to hit an error page, uh, he puts little gifs of funny magic tricks in it or magic tricks going wrong. Mm. So there's always a nice little bonus if you do spend enough time there looking around. He, um, I, I, am I correct in saying that he, he also has Conjuring credits as well? Conjuring credits is part him, part Stephen Minchin, part Max Maven, I think. Right. Um, so Stephen Minchin, Max Maven, had a Conjuring credits list, which Minch was always using when he was publishing books. Mm -hmm. He was trying to keep track of earliest known references for a variety of different things. Yeah. Uh, that was done, first of all, analogue. Uh, then later, I believe it shifted to a digital thing, but in the form of a shared document on a, an online file storage thing, which a few people had access to. Yeah. And then at some point, Dennis, who had already started running his archive site, um, was approached and decided that actually, yes, you could turn this into effectively a Wikipedia type thing. Right.